I mean, you've got to make things relevant. You've got to make it clear why we're doing it. Um, talk to any mathematician who's doing mathematics as a profession. Their face will light up. They'll get excited. They'll get involved in it. They'll tell you what they're doing because it's fun, exciting stuff. Sitting on most math classes, do you see fun and excitement? Not usually. Mm. Yeah, yeah, we're sitting here in, in, on Stanford University and about 200 metres away is where Google was invented. <coughs> Google was invented by two graduate students at Stanford <coughs> and it's a black piece of mathematics. Was it, it was a project. It was a master's degree project and it was for finding books in libraries, for finding information in libraries. It was funded by the, 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 the American Library Association. And they came up with this idea and they went to their advisor and said, we want to do this. And they said, that's not going to work. Try something else. And, and to his credit, he said, to the student's credit, he, the advisor said, they did the right thing that we want a good student to do. They took no notice of the advisor. They went ahead and wrote the thing and made it work. Um, but the, the accepted wisdom was that what they were trying to do wouldn't work. But it's a piece of mathematics. And it's a piece of mathematics that changed life on Earth. Uh, one of the powers of mathematics, and this is kind of what makes it exciting, is you don't need a huge laboratory to do mathematics. You need a paper and pencil, waste paper basket to collect the paper, and maybe you maybe you'll need a computer for some parts of mathematics. But you can come up with an idea in your bedroom or in your bath or when you're out riding your bicycle or running in the hills. And within a year or so, that idea can change the entire world. Uh, that's kind of dramatic. And that's what it is to be in the information age, the digital age, and this is why, actually, today, mathematics is one of the most exciting disciplines there is. There's not many chances that a young person can change the world and become a multi-billionaire by the time they're 25. You can do that in mathematics. Uh, that's exciting. Uh, and we know it can be done because it's been done, not just once, but several times. I've got a... I can't remember, I think it was probably an email, it may have been a phone call, I suspect it was an email. Some years ago from the head of the public defender department in, in Washington DC, there was a capital murder case that had gone to appeal. Um, it was based on a cold hit identification and this is where DNA evidence gets really, really dubious. Uh, that's where you, you, do a th you, know, you, you have a crime, you have some DNA samples from the crime and the, the, the authorities in this country, it's the FBI that usually does this, they trawl through their database um, which is, I think at the moment has about six million entries. At the time I got involved in this a few years ago, it was three and a half million entries. They're trawl through looking for a match. Um, it's important to notice that we're not talking about a match of the DNA. If you match your DNA, then almost certainly that's a proof of, of identity. We right. don't think that two different people have the same DNA, ev even identical twins. It's, 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 it's believed they're different. It's, a, it's an assumption, but it's a reasonably good one. Um, what we're talking about in DNA identification, at least in this country, is they pick 13 different loci on your DNA sequence and attach to each one of those a number. So your DNA profile in the FBI database, if you have one, is a sequence of 13 numbers. So then the question is, if you're using DNA to, to, to prove identity, how likely is it that two people randomly chosen from the population will have those same 13 numbers? It's like asking, how likely is it that two people in the same conference have the name John? Well, the answer is pretty likely. Uh, in fact, you can pick an unusual name like Sebastian and you probably have a, a match. In fact, the classic case that shows that you often do get accidental matches is the following surprise. You only need 23 people in a room to have a better than 50% chance that two of them share the same birthday. The fact is, when you're having populations of any size, and 23 is already large for this to happen, random coincidences occur. So with DNA identification, the issue comes down to what's the likelihood that two different people chosen at random share the same 13 numbers? The answer is it's quite high, um, and it depends on how many you pull from, from what population you pull. With cold hit identification, now, in the case of DNA identification, the way it's supposed to be used, and originally, well, the first of all, there's proving innocence. Proving innocence is like the scientific method. You only have to show the, show the DNA doesn't match. The person is, 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 well, the person may be guilty, but not because of that evidence. And if, you, if, if the DNA doesn't match, then the DNA has no probative value. You have to release the person. It's irrelevant. Yeah. If the DNA does match, then you're into this issue is, is it matched because you were there at the crime scene and you committed the crime? Or did the DNA get there through some other means? Or is it just a random occurrence? You know, one of the classic cases is, is, is rape cases. Well, it could be 
that the suspect you have just had sex with that person the same day or the day before, and that's where the, the, the DNA came from. Or it could be it's just an accidental match of someone who wasn't even near the crime scene. So, so for the courts to accept it, they need to have a calculation of how likely is it that that DNA match is just an accident. In other words, what's, its, what's, the, what's the probability that its probity value can be accepted? So that's a statistical issue, and the calculations have to be made. If it's done correctly, it's still incredibly accurate. And here's the, the, what I would say about correctly. Supposing the police, there's a crime committed, the police or the FBI, they, they find a suspect based on some evidence, but it's not conclusive evidence. You then take a DNA reading from that person, get their sample and compare it. If you get a match on even eight or nine loci, the chance, I mean, the, it's astronomical odds that the person is guilty. If I was on a jury, the person was identified by other means and you get a DNA match on eight or nine loci, let alone the full 13, the chances of that being a false dec declaration of, 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 of guilt are one in many, many billions. I mean, it just isn't going to happen because the odds just multiply together and they get astronomical. Where it gets problematic is where you don't have a suspect and you do a dull, a, and you do what's called a gold, try that one again. You do what's called a cold kit, well, you do what's called a cold hit identification. You trawl through the database until you find a match. Now you've got a real problem. Here's the way to think about it. Supposing you went out today and you bought a California lottery ticket. Now, the odds of winning the lottery, the jackpot, is about 1 in 30 million. And yet, on a regular basis, people win the jackpot. Why? Well, there's 35 million people in California, and about that number of tickets are bought. Not everyone buys them, but a lot of people do. If 35 or 40 million tickets are sold, then it gets quite likely that someone's going to win. Okay, now if I sent you out to buy a ticket and you came back with the winning ticket, I would be staggered. However, if we open the newspaper and say, oh, Alice Cooper down in Sacramento won the lottery, and we then go to interview her, well, we're only interviewing her because she won the lottery. It's no longer a surprise. If you identify a suspect because the DNA matches, that's like going and interviewing the lottery winner after they've won it. Yes. The trick is, does the DNA match after you've identified them? You know, if I sent you out to buy a lottery ticket and you and you got a winner, I'd think this guy must know something. You know, he's in cahoots with the, with the cahoots with the lottery people, because it just doesn't work that way. The odds of the odds of you winning are astronomically small. The odds of someone winning are quite high. The odds of someone matching the DNA is quite high. If you then find them by their DNA. All you've done is find the lottery winner after they've won the lottery. Doesn't prove anything. Yes. And that's what we're up against with DNA identification in cold hit cases. That's where the only evidence identifying the person is that DNA profile itself. That's not enough to convict, in my view, and in the view of all, most statisticians and probability theorists, that's nothing like enough to convict.